Delighted to be here. My name is Leandro, and I can't say it in Gaelic. Uh, my wife is Irish, so I sent her a text this morning and said, you have to help me, you have to help me because something is going on here that I didn't know. So she sent me an audio file. Do you think I can repeat that? <laughs> I, can, uh, I can understand a few languages. I can speak Spanish, English, or Spanglish, three languages. So the rest of the presentation will be in Spanglish, of course. Um, but I'd like to be here and hopefully bring in some uh, new ideas. Let me, uh, let me show you something. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do, is it? Hello? Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he could fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. is worse than being wrong. It's the worst state. And we are stuck many times in our day-to-day -day life, management of organizations, institutions. We are waiting for something to happen, like in the elevator. We are waiting for permission. We are waiting for the right time, for the right people to have all the data. We are just in a waiting mood all the time. We are as stuck as these guys in the elevator. And I repeat, that's a worse state than even being wrong. At least when you are wrong on something, you are something, but no other stuck. Now, Kevin says this, uh, stay away from still people, still broke, still complaining, still hating, and still nowhere. And if Kevin says that, I agree with that, because I agree with Kevin. Kevin is a very important person. He's, he's the president of the United States in Series 5, so <laughs> I, I have to... I have to yes do it. So, but being stuck and being waiting, I'm not joking, is something that we do and, and people see changes around them in the environment and we don't do much. We see things coming. We sometimes <laughs> admire the problem and say, that's very nice, you see. And we have these huge problems in our organizations. And by the way, let's, let's do something with that which is called change which is the most prostituted word in the management and leadership, uh, blah, 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 because nobody knows what that is. Because everybody is using this term all the time, from politics to organizations to everything else. However, when people say to me, change is very difficult, and that's the problem, and, uh, and uh, people are resistant to change, which is a very stereotype thing that people do. I've been in this business for a little while, and uh, I don't believe it. I think that we are changing all the time, and it's far from it. We are a changing organism, so I don't think we are resistant. Maybe it will be something else, but not resistant. Certainly, in society, things have changed enormously uh, between these two or three generations, probably, that uh, they are there. We've seen enormous social change. Certainly, this country has seen, seen, my country has seen, everybody else. Huge changes that just the, the granny uh, um, wouldn't, you know, would perhaps not, uh, the lady, the young people, I, I want to say, wouldn't believe that the granny had seen things like that, for example. The granny saw things like that. 
okay? That was yesterday. That was yesterday in the history of mankind. All things like that. Not a joke. It was yesterday. All things like that. For goodness sake, how early it could be to start on Coca-Cola on somebody. You know, this is, uh, and today, um, people in here, the audience and everybody else would say, oh, that's absolutely nonsense. Well, it was yesterday. Now, from that yesterday, what we have is tremendous changes in society. Still, there are gaps that we haven't managed to cover. For example, the access to health. Many people are doing very well or reasonably very well. We are very privileged in these countries to have that. In other countries, that's not the case. So change in many aspects, lack of change in others. And by the way, we have the whole digital aspect, which I'm not going to touch upon, but it's a big change that we all have and impact in our lives and in your roles and your jobs and mine and impacts on politics and impacts on everywhere else. We, even revolutions could perhaps have been said that it could have started like that. So I'm going to bring some glasses here for the day, for the rest of the day. After lunch, after a beautiful presentation, this is a difficult one, but I'm going to try. Because I'm not coming to you with the possession of the truth, but with some glasses that I think some ways of seeing the world, which I hope will be very practical and useful for you in the excellent work that you do. And let me, let me bring these glasses like that. There are actually a very funny set of glasses because there are four of them, but instead of two. Uh, so I don't know what you see from that. But the model is very simple. It says, look, one thing is communicating stuff, messaging, which we are not that bad. Everybody's doing that all the time, and that's fine. Another thing is to expect triggering behaviors. OK, that's a little bit not necessarily the same. So I want people to do something. But you know, still, we all trigger some behaviors in somebody else. Uh, so uh, that's not bad. But another thing is to sustain change, whatever change could be. It's not the same as messaging. And another, another completely different thing could be to create a shape, a culture for the long term. So they're completely different things. And that is the point that I'm going to unbundle a little bit. That if we spend, or people spend, a lot of time on the messaging and communication, for example, interesting and sexy as that is, pretending that we are going to shape a culture or create sustainable change, we are kidding ourselves. So as professionals that you are in different areas, ourselves, other, we need to know where we are in that process of change, social change, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter the label, but meaning, are we serious that we want to just send information and close our eyes? Or do we want to trigger behaviors, but we don't bother about how much these behaviors are going to be in the system one week from now? Or no, no, we want that to be sustainable. OK, that's a different thing. And by the way, more than sustainable, we want to create a culture, a society, a country. They are not the same. I'm stating the obvious. But let me unbundle these things and see what the mechanism could be behind. And then let me start with these two at the beginning, the, the first two together, which is what I call persuasion systems. Ways of saying to people, look, this is good for you. This is important. We care about you. Or these are the guidelines. And here, we could go for hours, but one thing that is puzzling me all the time is how much when we talk about communicating, uh, which is fine, and that's the topic of today, we are in our minds, one of the speakers mentioned that, we think we are creating an audience. But today, an audience is an audience. An audience is a quite passive world. You want to create a community. And a community is somebody is more than an audience. It's people who engage with you. Creating an audience is not that bad, not that difficult. You are here. You are my audience. If you like it, OK, fine. If not, you fall asleep. But that's it. Now, engaging with you on some discussions that could be later on or another point, that's a different thing. So that's, that's the first very simple thing to remember, that having an audience doesn't mean we are doing an engagement with people, whether it is in the hospital or in, the, in society or whether it's in, a, in an organization. So uh, it, it's, uh, many of the marketing people don't understand that yet and think that having a big audience is something that is important. Of course it is, but the audience could be silent or could do very little for you, or could be engaged in an opportunistic way only when they want. Is that what it is? That's what it is. Now, sometimes 
engaging and communicating doesn't even need to say a lot. I have this just sample I found the other day because it's, I think it's beautiful. This is uh, the best possible brand communication uh, management system that you can think of. Do you see any logo there? Do you see any reference to a brand? Any reference to anything? Brilliant. Now, if you don't know what this is advertising, you have to come back from Mars. From your, from your sabbatical and, and just come to us. But, but that, is, that is a very simple way to say, look, there are ways to say things without saying things. So communicating is something more complex than having a set of words and having to stick the logo and stick the message all the time. So, okay, let's this thing two together. Now, let me go next into the triggering behavior. So, okay, so there is a lot of things that we can do about communicating, but Surely, we want to trigger some behaviors. It means that something is going to happen. Well, here, the whole, the whole area that so-called behavioral economics come in. And I don't know whether you have, you know, probably you have read a few things around that. But here, economics come from, from a very simple uh, position, which is that the traditional economics said something like, given choices, people will make rational decisions by maximizing the utility once assessing all the data, blah, blah, blah. And the blah, blah, blah is very, very important in economics. Uh, so, so now, it's an assumption that we are rational and we make rational decisions. The entire economics is built on that. Now, hands on, on uh, up, who, was the, the, you know, who has made a rational decision recently? Uh, because uh, we don't make rational decisions. So the whole and the entire economic system is based on a flawed a set, uh, uh, you know, assumption about human beings and mankind. So behavioral economics come along and say, seriously? Do you think so? Come on. It's about emotions. It's about behaviors, etc. And the whole series of books that I say and, and uh, interests come in. I'm not going to develop that in detail, but I'll give you a, a few little examples on how we can go now to the triggering aspect as opposed to just the, the communicating. And in the, trigger, uh, the triggering uh, aspect, important thing is to make sure that what you trigger is what you want to trigger. That sounds very stupid, but you know, it's, it's, you know, I think that by doing something and triggering A, I'm getting B. I mean, something wrong with that, no? That's okay. All right, let's look at that. Have you seen that before? Okay. What is he saying? Well, he's saying the sky will fall on you if you abuse anybody in this hospital. Okay? What is this? What is actually saying? Abuse is normal in this hospital. Abusing nurses, he could be fun. That's what he's saying. Otherwise, why would you bother to say that and to put that on the wall? So he's saying, something wrong is here, by the way, and I will punish you if you continue doing something. But people may not even be aware that that thing was wrong. You want to trigger A, you get B. Same applies in many places. Terminal 4, Terminal 5, security, is, it is our intention and policy that both passengers and staff are treated with respect and dignity. Threatening or abuse behavior will not be tolerated, Heathrow police. Uh, community are here to support and enforce this policy. Wow, they must get lots of abuse every day, these people. <laughs> a violence against the staff, the Saturday. Say, and my favorite one actually is something that looks like that. It says, do not feed the ducks. Duck feces causes infections and pollutions. Thanks for your help. <laughs> now, this is a hospital window. So what is it telling you? This is bloody dirty, excuse my language. <laughs> That's what they say. So you are, with the best of intentions going one way, you are getting in your mind, whether you like it or not, a completely different message. I could go forever on that because, you know, there's plenty of that stuff everywhere else. Abuse, don't do it, I'll kill you, et cetera, et cetera, which means, oh, my God, it must be fun around here because uh, there's lots of things going on. So reframing is going to be very important because... You know, the message is nothing wrong with the message, but the question is, is it going to do what he intends to do? Which is something that, in general, in our communication systems need to be aware. We communicate something, and the first question mark is, 
do people hear what I communicate? Do they hear exactly the same that I think I'm talking about? Uh, you know, is this, is this very famous quote I use all the time. I don't know where it comes from, but I love it. It says, I told them once, and they didn't understand. I told them twice, and they didn't understand. I told them three times, and I understood. <laughs> you know, it, some, we, we talk a lot. Do people hear us in the same way? So, so are we, the question here would be, are we really seriously triggering a behavior that is the one that we are supposed to be triggering, or are we creating something and opening a Pandera box? I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm saying the question is legitimate, and we have to ask ourselves what we do it. Now, in the reframing area, uh, there are many other examples which are very well publicized. You've seen that many times. I took from God knows from where, but all the hotel rooms have these things today, dear guests, we love the planet, uh, we don't want towels, uh, don't use water, don't go to the shower, stay dirty because this is very good for the planet, and uh, don't do anything else, um, you will save the planet. It's proven a million times that that doesn't do anything. You know what it does? It's been proven, this, something that looks like that. Most people occupying this room use one towel. And it changes completely the behavior because you tend to copy the previous person on what's <laughs> happening. That reduces, that's not a joke, you may laugh, but it reduces seriously, significantly the amount of towels used, which is what you want to do. Not saving the planet, I mean, it's that, okay? Same applies here on that. Uh, dumping litter will, will kill you if you get litter and, and everything else is the finest and normals and everything. Every single park has that. Montana parks in the U.S. They did experiments years, years ago. Didn't go anywhere with that, not much, really. But they did go miles with this or something like that. Last six months, people took home X tons of litter. You want to be one of them? Oh, yeah. So that's it. So it's a complete reframing, trying to make something that happens. Another one that is my favorite, although I make that up, so because I had to make up once from time to time, is that, that uh, this is a very UK type of situation. Teenager binge drinking, chronic problem, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, everybody's falling apart on a Friday evening. All the teenagers are drunk, are vomiting, are in bad stage, and it's absolutely awful. And that is bad. Okay, yeah, I think we have a problem. But actually, an alternative is to say 90% of teenagers don't get drunk over the weekend. Which is true. Or, I don't know whether it's 90 or whatever it is. Which, which one do you think is going to have more effect on pulling behaviors on teenagers or the society and everything else? The one that says, yes, we have a problem, but most of the people don't. Now, which side do you want to be? The one that they don't, don't have a problem or the one that have a problem? Reframing. Reframing, reframing. My favorite last uh, is, is something to do with punishment. This is a, a kindergarten. This is that many, and still, I mean, I still have friends in the US, I think it is, that says, if you get late to pick up your kid in the kindergarten, you pay $10 or something like that. Do you have this here? Okay. Answer is $10? Oh, that's worth going late. You know, I can budget for that. You know, I can, I, you know, so, so four days a week being late is about $40. That's worth my being late and not having to pick up the kids. Punishment is not doing what it's supposed to do. We are killing ourselves. And that's very simple and very stupid, but people still are doing that. So this whole area of behavioral insights, behavioral economics, behavioral triggering, behavior or whatever you want to call it, is taken very seriously around the world. And there are more and more teams of people working on that. The UK has one sort of thing in the number 10. Australian has as well. And in the United States, there is a full paraphernalia in the White House, which is called the Social and Behavioral Science Team. Could you believe it? Such a sexy term. That's, that's fantastic, but not only that, there is next to that, there is an executive order from Obama. You see the, the thing that was saying, you will use these insights in policy making. It's instructing everybody else to be very clear about the use of this for positive things. He's saying it's not a joke, and he will know very well because he had plenty of them as, uh, uh, advising him in the elections. Okay, I still, I'm still in the reframing, I'm still, I'm still in the triggering, don't lose me, I'm still in the triggering behaviors, the question is whether I trigger the right ones or the wrong ones, but I'm still in triggering. Let's have a look at this. 
You may have seen that before. And if, if, you, if you have, pretend you have it. <laughs> of them in YouTube or anywhere else, Google them, and there was a prize at some point on getting the best idea and everything else. What is good about this? Come on. Just it. It's fun. It's simple. Was it effective? Oh, yeah. OK, so triggering behavior? Absolutely, yes. What is the problem, if any problem? Well, novelty, is it a problem? Well, no, it's just a factor, okay, novelty, okay, Get, what else? What is the potential problem with this? I'm just, you know, I'm not looking for a very uh, complicated answer. Yes? <laughs> it's part of the communications team. Expensive could be, yeah, okay, but it's still, you know, uh, if you had the money, that, that, that's fine, that's a very good idea. What else? <laughs> so it's triggering, it's modeling, it's saying that's something that you can do and you do it, okay. Nobody's getting to the point I want you to get, but so I'm going to get you. It changed? On that, that place. Well, yes, obviously, the, you don't have the, the thing, you, you don't do it, but okay, but it's getting there a little bit like that. Ah, who said that? That's very clever of you, actually. <laughs> mean sustainability, the colleague says, meaning for how long do we have to have these stairs there? Do we have to have the entire city and the entire system with this? When all the stairs are working in the same way, could people start saying, well, I don't care anymore? Uh, so it's sustainability. So triggering behaviors was fun, was good, it was done, great idea. Sustainability, well, they didn't probably intend it. <laughs> but still, this is a very, very, very serious topic because we do lots and lots and lots of things that they are a one-off shot, one-off initiative, a triggering of something. People get very excited, including this conference and things like that, and then everybody forgets everything in the car park. We are very good at the one shot. We are very good at triggering, or reasonably very good, but it's not that easy, or we are not that good, or maybe we don't pay enough attention to what is next, and is next is the other two sides of, of the social change, which is the sustaining aspect and the creating on the future. And you will see that I put my two books there because they have to be somewhere. So <laughs> one thing are the persuasion, persuasion systems that we've seen, the communicating and triggering. And by the way, going backwards for a second, yeah, well, no, well, no backwards, I'm still where I, where I am. The entire nudge systems 
number 10 in the UK, in, 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 in the government, in Australia, but everywhere else, are very much focused on the triggering. The problem is that they haven't got a clue what to do next. And the sustainability, what we call the network effect, meaning, so what happens now? How much of the network density I need to have for this to still be happening three months from now? If you have a campaign on something, you don't supposed to stop tomorrow. And that is not something that they have crafted well at all. They don't want to hear that, so don't quote me. That's fine. I live in the UK, so I have to be very careful what I'm saying. But that is the reality. So I need to tell you now to the next two, which is the sustaining aspects of the shaping and reinforcing behaviors and then creating a culture. I'm using these terms in, in a very broad sense. And I need to introduce you here to the saint pattern of this. We have a saint pattern in, in, in barrel chains and in child phone project and in those these mobilizing platforms. And it's St. Francis. Preach the gospel all the time, comma, when necessary, use words. It doesn't get better than that. <laughs> now, I'm using lots of words here, so it must be necessary maybe for me to do that because my saint is saying, no, mate, that's not what you should do. Obviously, it was very easy for St. Francis to say that because it was all the time with animals, so uh, they couldn't <laughs> talk to him, so probably that's why. But I need to introduce you now to how this could work. And to do that, I need to introduce you to the world that we are today, your world, my world, the world of 9 to 5 or 24 uh, 7, the, the world of business, of society, of everything that we do, which I'm going to suggest to you that in reality is a combination of two very different worlds that have different laws, and I'm going to show you that. And one is what I call world one, and world one is the one where communication and information is the currency. That's a world in its own right. So we have communication, we have information, we package the information, we send them down the management systems, the hierarchical systems of the organization, we package, we use the expression, in English, we cascade down, do we? So it's a cascade of stuff, it's a tsunami type of thing that comes from somewhere and floods everything else. Uh, he likes the hierarchy, he likes the repetition because uh, that's what the channels are, and it's a push system. We are pushing things down. I'm not making any judgment that this is bad. I'm saying this is what it is. It's a, it's a push world where information is the currency, and which is very good for anything that has to do with educating people, sensitizing them, motivating them, training, management. Uh, if I, in, in corporate audiences and, and, and you as well may say, well, I recognize that world, that's my world nine to five, that's what I do. I push information up and down, usually down, but that's what it is. Okay, that's one world, but there is a different world, completely different world, which I call world two. And here, the currency is behaviors. Ah, behavior is something that people do, people exhibit, is something that people have to do. There is no something that you can put in PowerPoint. Behaviors hate PowerPoint. Power, words in the PowerPoint are words. They are no behaviors. Behaviors are only when some people are doing something. So behaviors don't travel in the same way as the information channels. It's a world in which we are copying each other all the time. We are copying with next door neighbors. We're copying what we see in the corridors in the hospital. Uh, we are copying what we see. We are fantastic, sophisticated copying machines. Whether we like it or not, many people say, oh, not me, no, no, I'm not copying anybody. But the way we wear, what we say, the norms that we have, the, the, the very important unwritten roles in organization, rules in organization are unwritten, and they are something that people copy all the time. So copy mechanism here is very important. It's a pull system because with my behavior, I'm pulling other behaviors around, and I'm pull whether I like it or not with the behaviors that I see around me, good or bad. So this is the, the kindergarten, uh, you know, I'm pulled by the kids in the kindergarten. Who do you think is more important in the school, the head teacher or the kindergarten? It is the, sorry, of the, of the, you know, the, I meant the, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the courtyard, I mean, whatever you call it, you know, what, the playground, the playground, that, that's the word I was looking for. It is the playground. The playground is where people copy. No kids go around copying the headmaster. 
they copied what they see in the playground. So you better go to send your kids to a good playground, not a good headmaster school. OK, so it's a pool system. And here, therefore, the spread of these behaviors could be viral because some people start doing something and other people copy and do that. And I, I sometimes use the, the, the analogy, which is good, of a mountain on fire. So you have a mountain and you have a little fire here, a little fire there, a little fire there, and suddenly the mountain is on fire. That's the culture. When the mountain is on fire, the mountain is on fire. How it started, whether the quality of the trees was good or no, whether three people started with a couple of matches is irrelevant. The mountain is on fire. In the change management business, people don't want to hear that, by the way, when we say they spend a lot of time looking at the readiness to change. The readiness to change is irrelevant, <laughs> completely irrelevant. Whether you are very ready, little ready, not ready, or whatever, you have to do exactly the same. So forget about it, and let's get on with things. <laughs> because if, if you wait for everybody to be at to level seven and a, half, and a half for readiness to be able to start something, you will get Alzheimer's before. <laughs> uh, so there is an urgency in here, so forget that. So this is a world where sits very well, anything that has to do with behavioral change, obviously, because I'm saying that the current is behavioral, cultural change, new norms, new rules, uh, new social norms, that is the world where the world, the, where the, this thing sits. I haven't said one is better than the other. You follow me so far, I'm saying they are very different worlds. And one of the problems we have everywhere is that, as follows. We have come to believe that something that belongs to world one has the ability to produce something in world two. It doesn't. Communication is not change. Cultures are not created by training. Behavioral change is social copying, and therefore belongs to the behavioral stuff, the ones that I have introduced a little bit before. That doesn't mean you stop doing communication. I'm saying, by all means, don't, don't stop, but you have to do more than that if you want to gain to the behavioral change. And by the way, the data is there all the time that about 75% of programs, so-called change programs of some kind that, that are communication-based only, trying to say, this is good for you, you have to go that way, this is the no, fail, simply fail. 75%, you see this number? Are you scared by this number? I would be scared. Could you imagine an a HR system that fails to recruit the right person 75% of the time? I'm not talking you have that, sorry, I'm not saying you have that. You know. Could you imagine an IT system that is 75% uh, of the time down? Um, you, you could, so you wouldn't put up with that level of irresponsibility. Uh, but we are very good at saying, well, yeah, 75, 75 fail, but let's do it again. Yeah, let's, let's, let's just communicate again and one shot things and close our eyes and see what happens. It is how we are <laughs> raised. This is the single slide that you know to know about psychology. It is a course on psychology in one slide. This is it. We copy each other and we say that uh, Homo sapiens was delivered by evolution, but he never got rid of Homo imitans. We are a incredibly sophisticated copying machine. But also there are a very extra important reason to understand the difference between world one and two, and this is very relevant. In world one, you start perhaps trying to communicate to everybody with a campaign, for example. You know that when you do that, some people pay attention to that. From the people who pay attention, some people start thinking of doing something, and some people are stuck, and eventually some people do something. Have you seen that before? Not in Ireland, obviously, not, not. But it's quite common, OK? So it's an attrition model. You create little bubbles. What do you do you, when you have a system that creates little bubbles and you don't quite like the little bubble? What is that you do? You do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, just hoping that the bubble gets bigger at the third or fourth time. But the bubble never gets bigger because at the third time, people switch off. And say, ah, enough of that. Another program, corporate, program, another whatever. I've seen that before. Now it's called something different. So switching off a system in which we are spending 75% of the time is 
a little bit serious risk. In World 2, however, you, we just said, you have some people doing something, other people copy that, you create some critical mass, other people uh, copy, grades bigger, and eventually everybody is doing something good or bad. I'm not making any judgment, but that's how it's a scale-up system. It goes from small to big. Now, at the very least, without making any judgment, you will have to agree with me that we, you, us, everybody, need to master the plus. Do you agree? We are not going to get rid of the communication systems because we need them, because we need to communicate, but creates little bubbles. So I need to have a pool system in parallel that is taking the goodness of the little bubble and is scaled up in behavioral terms. So you have, for example, a value system coming down and saying, that's what you need. You may have to have a translation of that value system into a specific behaviors that some people can take and say, that's what I do. Could you come with me, please? Can we do it together? And you take Mary and whatever, and we get together next week and we do something and it scales and scales and scales. We have this morning a fantastic presentation on the, on the what's the name, Kate, no, Kate? Uh, uh, what do you think that happened there? How, how did it happen? You know, was there any, any training meeting that you can think of that put together and say, this is how you wear the bloody badge, <laughs> excuse my language, or this is how you do it, or this is why, even the why. I haven't heard of any training session. I just heard of people start doing something, some people following that, and suddenly everybody's doing that. It's a behavioral thing. It's neat and it works because it's very simple. And people can relate to that, say, ah, I can do that. I don't need a PhD on, on emotional intelligence to be able to understand that that is good. It's simple, it's good, and by the way, I'm going to get Mary to join me. So the whole thing scales up. Plus other elements that, includes, including the, the emotional aspect of the whole thing, which, which are, are very, very helpful. So we have that, and the currency as in each of the worlds are very different. You have to agree with me. In the world one, you need some kind of command and control system, an information system that goes down. You need some channels, which are very important. You need to cascade down, and you get some kind of awareness and training. I'm not suggesting or saying for a second that you have to stop doing that. Don't. If you hear me do, saying that, I'm not doing a very good job, because what I'm saying is that you need that and a system in which pulls the whole thing and scales up, which is behaviors. As soon as you need behaviors, you're going to have to know about the social influence. You agree? The behaviors go through influence. Now the question of who is influencing whom, it becomes relevant. Not it's who has the information. It's not who got what in terms of the information. It's who can influence whom in doing some behaviors. That's a completely different question to ask. Then I'm going to have the informal channels, because I haven't heard any team committees or task forces in the things this morning. And we're going to have some storytelling system that tells the world this is happening already, don't wait too much. And we're going to have some leadership element there that uh, supports the whole thing. I don't have the time, nor you have the, the, probably the, the energy to go one by one and unbundle that. I'm going to focus on a couple of things, just to say that's a world that needs to be cover needs to be, somebody needs to do something, and it's relevant to your world, wherever you are, to mine, because it's a push and pull going together. It's not just the push only. That is the message I'm trying to achieve. Because if you are, for example, in the messaging element, that's in the people doing branding, you could say, well, for example, in the world one, you have everything that has to do with messaging. I'm talking corporate here. People say defending a brand, telling the story of the company, for example, projecting an image, understanding, motivating, advocacy. That all sits very well in world one. You agree? But if you move to world two, what you need is people following you. Ah, that's very different. You need a peer-to-peer -peer element that, that people talk to each other and do something together. You need the community. You need the informal organization. So you need a completely different world. Staying in one world, pretending that you will create something in the other world, is very naive. And all I'm saying is we need to learn to master the plus between the two worlds. I don't care whether you are a head of clinical something, doing some clinical stuff. You still have to do that. You have a push system of information, and you need to have a pool of people taking that in behavioral terms. So you need to know, you need to know what is that I'm saying, but also you need to know what I want people to do following that and creating a community that scales up. If you don't have a scale-up plan, you have, at the very least, 
50% of the story. So embarking upon anything, whether it's in the clinical setting, in the information setting, administration, whatever it is, that is a fantastic push system that doesn't have a pull plan is very risky because it will last for as long as needed, but no, a little bit no more. Okay, so let me get you, let me, let me show you something else here because I want you to have a look at this little thing. <laughs> Sir, आपके लिए उस पार कार का इंतजाम किया है। Sir, आइए सर। ये चल चल। और चलो पकड़ के चलो पलक पकड़ के उठो और हवा पकड़ के चलो पलक पकड़ के उठो और हवा पकड़ के चलो तुम चलो तो हिंदुस्तान चले तुम चलो that. Ah, beautiful. Uh, who started the whole little revolution of moving trees? A boy. Who followed? His peers, more boys, who woke up at some point and joined the rest, the adults, and who said anything in English in the entire video? A woman in the bath, well spot on. You know, remember what she said? I hate this country. <laughs> That's it. That, that, that was it. Everything else is, is somewhere else. Now, I'll let you read this, please. I don't have to read it for you. Not in Ireland, but this is quite normal in many organizations, in many institutions. So the question is very simple. Who do you want to call? <laughs> Who do you want to call for the revolution? Who do you want to have next to you to do what you have to do? Uh, because you, there are choices there. Now, so ne I need to unbundle that a little bit. Do I have a few more minutes? Yeah, OK. Um, Ireland is always so generous with time and remembers, remembers my country. The, question, the concept of time is not quite there in the psyche. So uh, it's good. So this is an organization on one side, a Simba's HR, and in the other, the real one. Okay, so the, the organization chart tells us about who reports to whom and who does what, but it doesn't tell us about the reality of the connectivity between the organization, between people in the organization, which is that messy network of connections, which when you look inside, actually, is not that messy, and you find something interesting, for example, that there are different clusters of people, um, some of them not connected. There are some people that are more connected than others in the system, that some people seem to have also a strange ability to cut across the clusters and be a bridge between clusters that otherwise wouldn't talk to each other. 
Now, if you have to choose some people there in that little graph about to call to arms and say, could you come and help to do something and scale up and move trees, lots of trees, who would you go? The yellow people. Would you not? I mean, they are going to have more pool ability than anybody else. That doesn't mean or make the rest irrelevant. It means you need to end the engine of the people who are not just looking at the tree and say, my God, I need a strategic plan to move trees. You want the ones that are moving trees. So you need the yellow people. Now, how many of these people are in any organization? Well, that's the good news and the bad news, depending on how you see it, because the distribution of connectivity and influence inside any organization that is a network, and tell me which one is not, doesn't follow a normal distribution. It follows something that looks like that. It's a logarithmic distribution. It's a power law, meaning there are relatively a small number of people highly connected and influent, and then there is the majority of people with low connectivity and influence. The organization is not equalitarian, it's not democratic. Some people have an ability to pull other people together and it has nothing to do with hierarchy and other people don't. Now, as a human being, one is equal to another. As an influencer that I can call to arms and please help me to move lots of trees, I need to know who has the power of influence. Because if I don't do that, I may be calling the wrong people. This is no different from what Margaret Mead, anthropologist, said many years ago. You've seen that hundred times. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Comma, indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Amen. That's what it is. So we all have a small numbers of people in organizations, highly influenced, highly connected, that they will be ready to be called to help. Now, don't tell me that you are going to ignore that now because it's impossible to ignore. The next question may be something, who are these people, where are they, how I call them, but you cannot ignore that. In communication terms, everybody is equal, everybody needs to get the message. In behavioral terms, we need also to bring on board people who are highly connected and highly powerful in terms of pulling behaviors, and they do not correlate with the hierarchy in the system. How many of you are familiar with the Edelman Trust Barometer? Edelman Trust Barometer. Okay, you will have to, because you have to go to the website, read it, it's free, and it's very important for the job you do. In the next two days, there will be a test if you don't do it. <laughs> Edelman is a PR company that goes around doing uh, analysis of the trust elements on, on businesses, on institutions, and it's the kind of data that you see every year then in the newspaper saying, in the Trust Barometer 2015, pharmaceuticals has gone down three points, and financial services are at the bottom, and now the lawyers are up, and by the way, Greece is low. So all that kind of stuff comes from here. But one of the, the, the things that they look for is where is the trust coming from inside an institution, on an organization, even in society. And then you have data that is incredibly similar every year. There are some differences, but it's very, very constant. You have on one side, in the kind of green side, in society, about 20% of people trust in government and 30% in business, around something like that. You see the data. And about 42% trust NGOs, which is not that great. Nothing reaches 50%. means trust is not very high, period. But okay, that's what it is. Inside organization, the lowest source of trust is the CEO. The highest source of trust is a category that in Edelman Trust Barometer is called people like me. Who is people like me? Well, you, and, and you, and, and you. I mean, we are working in different places, but we send the kids, the kids to the same schools. We talk about football. Uh, we have the same problems, talk about holidays. Uh, you are a manager, I'm not, but that doesn't make anything. You are like me. You are people like me. You are my transversal, horizontal, mates, peer, colleagues, tribes, whatever you call it, which I trust more than anything else they are telling me. Now, would you like to ignore that, or would you like to engage that and say, ah, then I have to know who inside any institution or any organization has this ability to be highly connected and highly trusted because if I engage them in a peer-to-peer -peer situation, I have a perfect dynamite, dynamite because it's peer-to-peer -peer and it's also the highest source of trust. 
So these people like me, it's been there for a long time. It's a category that is used. It's, it's telling us in a different way that you have, on one hand, you have the top-down systems that in any organization has, like the, the top leadership, the communication systems, you know, coming down, the cascade down of things to do. But the stuff happens at the horizontal level of peer-to-peer, -peer, the tribes, the informal networks. This is where the real stuff happens. Plenty of data and innovation, for example, that the good ideas don't come from the formality of teams, committees, task forces, or innovation centers. They come from the day-to-day -day conversations in the corridor and from the peer-to-peer -peer interactions. It cannot be longer ignored. We have to take it. And in societal terms, you can make exactly similar a case saying we have the top-down systems, which are the politicians and the communication people or religious leaders, and everybody else coming down in societal terms saying this is good, this is where we are going, nothing wrong, don't stop doing that, but the real stuff is going to happen there on a patient-to-patient, youth-to-youth, gun-to-gun, family-to-family. This is where stuff happens. For anybody in health management, one way or another, needs to know that. We can't ignore that. And it's full of data behind that. So 20 social workers are not worth one ex-family dysfunctional that talks to a normal family. Therefore, don't stop the social workers, but be aware there are limitations in our top-down systems of messaging and persuasion that real stuff happens in the transversal scale-up of the peer-to-peer, -peer, and we need to know and learn how to manage that. In the gun situation, this is very proven. Very, uh, this is a, a program in Chicago many years ago started called, uh, started called Ceasefire. Now it's called something different. Um, and they had all the ways to tell people violence is bad for you. Please stop, but uh, nobody stopped anything. And they start, uh, surprise, surprise, involving ex-gun people with gun members. And in the year one of this program, 42% of crime decreased in the streets of Chicago where this program was there. Nothing seen before. So it's the peer-to-peer -peer situation. Now, I'm going towards the end of this, of this <laughs> trying to embrace this scale-up because I'm going to suggest to you that in any organization, in any institution, at any point, you will have something that looks like that, a, a, a combination of connections, a network in which you will have people perhaps call it in that way. If black will be uh, uh, new behaviors are established, pink are exposed or changing their mind, the green people are the ones that are not changing, and then the gray status because uh, nobody knows where these people are. Does it sound reasonable, like a random Wednesday afternoon in your institution, whatever it is? Yeah? Very good, because I'm cheating you, because that has nothing to do with an organization. This is, you will know, some of you very clearly, it comes from the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and it's the spread of a disease, an infectious disease. Clinicians, you've seen that before many times. Method, it is exactly the same. Behavioral copying, behavioral infection, good or bad, follows exactly the same laws of epidemiology, and the same as physical infection, idea infection, fat infection. It's exactly the same, follows the same. That cannot be ignored anymore. If you are in the... Uh, in the business of changing something or doing something, you are in the infection business. We are not in the broadcasting business. Actually, I literally may be politically incorrect in this audience, and I'm not suggesting you use that, but I use with corporate uh, setup every single day. I use the language of epidemics. Let's create a good epidemic of. I'm a medical doctor by background, as you know, so it doesn't get better than a good epidemic. Uh, a good epidemic is something that is there. So you want accountability in the system? It would be good to have a good epidemic of accountability. <laughs> could you imagine that we could say, teamwork here is endemic? Could you imagine that we start using the language of this is such entrenched here? That would be fantastic. It's not a job. It's something that we use all the time. It's not just a semantic trick. It's that follows exactly the laws of epidemic. So now I could just say that, just to finish these lenses, is that at the, at the top I have the same, but now I'm saying, just, this is the push and the pull. The push goes that way and goes that far, but at some point the pull needs to take over, and probably somewhere in the middle is where we have to be. So we all have to do some communicating, some messaging, some triggering, don't stop that, but we need to look at how we scale that, how we sustain. And even if you say, 
well, in my role, I'm not, I don't see myself in the business of creating this sustainable change for whatever reason. That's fine. You know, put yourself somewhere, but don't pretend that you are anywhere else. So if that's what you do, that's what you do. But the spectrum of social change doesn't, cannot stop at the one or two. It has to go beyond that. It has to go from having a persuasion systems that we are very good at and having a mobilizing platforms, something that people can jump in and then say, I'm going to do something. Now, I dare to bring this as a kind of final thing because this is a bit of sort of, I'm pushing the envelope and say, if I had to translate that into a health system, which you are the expert, I'm not, I would say I could have a comparison between the corporate world and the health world and say in the push system, you have anyway communication campaigns, top down, hierarchical, blah, blah, blah. And if you're talking about employees, you say, well, the employees provided with information, guidelines, an airtime, a voice, have a voice, that's the push system. And in the case of societal, the citizen is provided with information, services, and access to them. You agree? I'm not saying anything wrong so far on that. You, you are the expert. The pull system will say, okay, in the corporate world or, or the, in the organizational area, the employee and the champions, I'm calling champion, by the way, in a very broad sense, we never call it in the same way to so these yellow people, the people who you call to them and say, by the way, can you help us? It's called in different languages, different ways, in many companies, in many programs that we have, we call activists because that's what they are. In some countries, it's politically incorrect to use the word activist because you will go to jail the following day. So we don't call it that. We call it champions or pioneers in French, accelerators in one place. I hate the term, but that's, that's how it is. So that's the matter how you call it is calling to arms the people who are going to help you and they are not necessarily in the hierarchical system. So I would say in the corporate world, that's what it is. In the societal health, in the pool system, the citizen also takes charge and takes responsibility individually and collectively. Now, I'm launching that. I'm not saying that's the plan, but I'm saying that is the translation in a back of an envelope of the organizational and health societal systems in a push of world, that is life will need many hours to be developed properly, but I'm making the point, it's both and they are there. Now, it's not gonna be easy, okay? It's a bumpy road. It's more of a bumpy road than the alignment of the cups of tea in the Chinese parliament, because that's what it is. That's why they ensure that the cups of tea are exactly in the same line. So they are the good, the best project management system there is. I mean, so project managers like that. So it doesn't look like that. It doesn't look like the Chinese ladies. It looks more like a bumpy road. Nothing can pretend otherwise that this is not something that you can do just like, like that. And it's not going to be something that everybody may like. Uh, and uh, some people may say, what about that? And, and that's what it is. But it's also finally something that uh, using Ram Manuel, now major of Chicago, and before head of staff in Obama, never let a serious crisis go to waste. Well, I don't know what crisis we have. I mean, let, <laughs> let's not let a situation where everybody is craving for something and trying to do something and fix something and say, yeah, well, we'll talk about it six months from now. Let's not get it to waste. The boiling thing is there. Why don't we get it and we do something about that? Some thoughts to finish. Last slide. All of that shouldn't be a surprise to you now. A stuck is worse than being wrong. Leadership and communications can't be outsourced. You can outsource some technical expertise and some people who help you with something, but it's something that comes with the leadership hat. You cannot say, I'm a leader, I'm a manager, but by the way, communication is something that the com communications department will do for me. It doesn't work like that. You are stuck like anybody else. You are not in the escalator. Uh, you shouldn't be in the escalator, so communications cannot be outsourced. You have to have clear goals. That, that's kind of stating the obvious, but I'm talking here about do you want to educate? Do you want to sensitize? Do you want to change things? Do you want to transform a culture? I mean, all these things are not the same. I'm not saying to you which one you have to pick. I'm just saying make sure you know which one you pick because they are not the same. I'm following, they are following completely different laws, as I have explained to you. So don't kid yourself that you are in an area expecting something that says, oh, it didn't happen, that program failed, it's been a disaster, it's the fourth time. Well, no wonder, because you are in the wrong bubble. And therefore, you are with the wrong laws, the wrong mechanisms, so of course it fails. Everything fails, but it doesn't have to. 
master the pull and push. Don't start, for goodness sake, any more push systems without having a good idea what the pull is going to be. Don't waste your time on that. Agree on non-negotiable behaviors. I hardly spoken about that and say, but have to agree on what are the translated behaviors of the things that we want to have and to have to uh, we want to see in the system. In the example this morning, it was very clear. It's very simple. Wear the badge, you know, and, and that is as simple. Not every time, all the time, you are you have the, the luxury of having such a very atomic behavior, as we call it in, my, in our terminology. That we call an atomic behavior. Actually, it's a micro behavior, like smiling, saying something that is, that is great. But you may need a little bit more than that to create a revolution. But that is what, how things start. Uh, engage peer-to-peer, bottom-up, the energy and motivation. You need to start thinking, at the very least, maybe you know already, who are the people in the organization that you could eventually call to arms and help you with the transformation of something that you need to do. They may or may not be in the hierarchical system. It may be the porter that you saw this morning. It may be the ones that are already doing something. It may be, you know, in terms of the behavioral change, transformation, cultural shaping, hierarchy is not completely relevant, but it's not the only thing. You need the hierarchy to support you, but with an incredibly supportive hierarchy, you don't create a revolution you have an incredibly supportive hierarchy, which is very different from having a revolution on the making. You have a very good team, but not the rest. And theme platform, no matter. Um, in, and in, in all this future that you have in front of you, that you have this bright and transformation that aims on this um, fantastic country that you have, which I envy, uh, I wish you every success. And I think there will be some questions at some point if we have the time. Thanks very much. Thank you.